Hello everyone! How are you teachers all around the world doing today? I hope you are fine. Welcome to another episode of our favorite podcast, Teach and Talk. I am Cynthia and I'll be your host for today. And in today's episode, me and our special guests are going to give our point of view on a very important topic, teaching a second language to teens and adults. Grab a cup of your favorite coffee or tea and open your ears to come with us on this journey. Hello girls! Hi! So, to start today, I would like to introduce our special guests. We have two teachers here with us, Tamara and Mariana. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, can you quickly introduce yourselves, please? Yes, it's my pleasure to be here today. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Tamara. I'm a student at UFAO. Currently, I'm on the seventh semester. Yes, uh, in the English letters course. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I am Mariana, and I'm a classmate of Cynthia and Tamada. Thank you, girls. So, as I already said, today's theme is teaching teens and adults, and I have a few questions for you. Um, to start, uh, my first question is, do you think it's possible to learn a second language in your late teenage years or adulthood? Uh, do people who begin with this age have any disadvantages? It's totally possible. It's indeed difficult to learn a second language when our critical period of learning is finished. That is because the older we get, the more we use and dominate our native language. So we always tend to think first in our native language. But this shouldn't discourage adults from learning because there are many ways to make learning more effective and it is completely possible to achieve your goals if you work with the right tools. Exactly. Even though it is different, I wouldn't say that your time is over and there is nothing to be done about it. Teaching teenagers and adults is different from, from teaching kids and this should be taken into account when planning lessons. Some people say that a child's brain is like a sponge absorbing anything that comes in its way, but when we grow older, we already have a routine that gives us new responsibilities and also opportunities. We have other priorities, other requests and demands. So it's so important to optimize our learning time. But as Samada said, I also agree it's something completely doable if we do it the right way. Yeah, I think I agree with both of you. I, in fact, am an example of a late English learner. I think I started learning English when I finished high school, and it was very hard to manage time and focus on learning. But uh, I was able to learn a lot, and now I am happy to consider myself fluent. And this is thanks to the amazing teachers that I've had in the process. Yes, it's very common to uh, start to learn English in our teenage years. I am also an example of it, of this. And having a good teacher who cares about the student's learning process and shapes the class based, based on their needs and necessities totally makes the difference. I'm glad that you had a good experience. Yes, I'm also glad that you shared this experience with me. Um, I would also like to mention that not everyone can reach this mindset, unfortunately, right? Uh, from my experience, I think people might feel discouraged from their ideas that their abilities might not be the same anymore. So, do you feel that this may block them from understanding their full potential? How do you think we can encourage students to overcome this? We talk so much about this, about how we are becoming limited and we are not going to learn in the same way. And on my opinion, I think when we are constantly being reminded of our limitations, we become blind to what we can do. But on the other hand, when we are encouraged to look at the possibilities we have, we can find out that it's not the end of the world. Learning a lot of another language after childhood, to me, means that we are brave enough to leave our comfort zone and face new challenges. Since our interests are better, better developed, we can use them in our favor. 
we have a higher autonomy in assessing content like books, music, articles, podcasts, and other forms of entertainment, and this can increase our engagement in learning. And also, making a clear decision to learn defines our motivations to keep going. Yeah, yeah I totally agree, Mari. In fact, uh, another thing that can influence these processes is the student's motivation. Uh, everyone has specific needs and wants when it comes to the objectives of learning a new language. So it's important to keep that in mind when planning the lessons and also engage with the students about the topics they like to create a connection and a good learning environment so they can feel motivated throughout the process. Yeah, I think motivation is the key, in fact. I I find it very difficult to learn when I'm unmotivated, and I think it's even worse when teachers seem like they don't care, you know? Yes. yes. So, yeah, uh, we know that being a teacher is difficult and tiring because we are teachers ourselves, yes. so we know how it works. <laughs> But we do have to make an effort to keep our students motivated and help them notice their strengths and deal with their weaknesses as well. Um, another question that I have for you is, as teachers, how do you think we can use these strengths and weaknesses to our advantage in planning? Um, I think I'm going to answer this question as well because I find it useful when I pay attention to their interests and try to work with that, like trying to use their most developed abilities to help them with what they struggle more, for example. I think it's important that our students feel seen. Uh, do you think you share the same feelings? Yes, for sure. For me, uh, the more you get to know your students, the better, because you can personalize each lesson to the specific needs of them. For example, uh, if you have a student or even a whole class that struggles of, with, um, let's say, the TH sound pronunciation, uh, you can dedicate one class to put more emphasis on that topic by creating a game or a competition or any activity that forces the class to collaborate together, solving problems and practicing that. And you can make it thematic, for example, if it's possible. I couldn't agree more with both of you. I think you are absolutely, absolutely right. And it's so crucial to know them personally and also understand what their goals are with the language. Like, are, there, are they planning a trip or do they want to take on new opportunities at work? Do they want to ace on reading or is oral communication what makes them confident? Different needs mean different planning. And if we do not understand their priorities, we will not be able to give them a good experience. Yeah, I think it's great to hear that from you. I, I love that we are agreeing on almost everything <laughs> yes. here. Um, Tamara. Uh, you talked about games and competition, uh -huh. and this is exactly what my next question is about. In your opinion, Mari, you can answer as well, okay? <laughs> uh, in your opinion, do you think games have a role in teaching a second language to things and adults? If so, what would be that role? Uh, we know that games can establish an entertaining and engaging atmosphere, but how would that work? I love that question. Uh, well, as a very competitive person myself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> if I have any opportunity to use games in my classes, I will. But first, let's to the practical thing and establish some uh, context here. Uh, defining game in this context, uh, according to a Russian research team, Game is an enjoyable activity involving an objective that is achieved by following certain rules, usually in competitions with one or more people. The games establish an entertainment and challenging atmosphere in which a task has certain boundaries that the opponent should follow. Well, with that in mind, uh, using games in classes is one of many strategies that teachers can apply to make the students engage and participate through and participate 
But it's important to keep in mind that even though it can be very fun and exciting, not everyone is competitive. So it's essential to know the class profile and adapt the games for them. Because if they don't like or feel or don't feel comfortable with the competitions or are too competitive, like my case, <laughs> <laughs> we need to be able to handle the situation and assure that our class is a, a safe space and that everyone is welcome to participate and learn. And unlike what common sense may think, teenagers and adults have fun and are as competitive as children when it comes to games. Yeah. These are great thoughts, Amada, and I think everyone who has been your opponent knows that this is <laughs> absolutely true. <laughs> And did you also know that researchers from Paraná studied the impacts of gamification on a 16-hour prep course for proficiency tests and found out a great impact on students' mood during the whole course? They increased the motivation, engagement, and self-confidence. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I it didn't is, know that. Yeah, and I think it's very important to also note that Preparing this kind of resource requires a lot of time and effort from the teacher. So, as you consider this possibility for your classroom, think about the advantages and disadvantages that might appear in the situation. Keep in mind the things that Amanda said, and if you think it's still worth it, go ahead and have fun. It's great that we have all of this information on gaming, uh, because I, f I think it's very fun to, to use gaming classroom. And in fact, I think being your student must be so fun. Uh, I also enjoy using games in my classes, but something I prefer to work with is music. Yes, that's uh -huh. very engaging too. Yes, yeah. I think it's an awesome way to engage your, uh, our teen students because everyone likes music. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And I hope you're right about the classes being fun. <laughs> I think we can each find what feels good for us, and only experience will show what works best for our students. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So, girls, that was a wonderful conversation, and I learned a lot from you guys, but I'm sorry to say our time is over. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But um, first, I want to ask if you have anything else you'd like to add to this conversation. Well, not really, but I had a great time talking about our experiences. And I hope this talk can be helpful or insightful for those who are listening. And thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, same for me. This was such a great experience. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank you so much, girls, for this amazing lesson. It was great having you here. Thank you. <laughs> and to our listeners, thank you for joining us in this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a teacher and listening to this on YouTube, share with us other tips in the comment section. And if you are a student, comment down below what your thoughts are in this process and how would you like to learn. Bye-bye, um, girls. Bye. See you next time. Tune in for our next episode.